Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. I'm Dominic and joining me every week is John and Jenna. And uh, before we get started, we normally like to give a little insight on what's going on in our on each other's lives. This week though, as uh, John and Jenna will attest to, this episode is bad. This is season one, episode 10, uh, enti- t- titled Glades. But uh, before we get started, Wanted to kind of give a quick rundown for anyone who's new joining the show, uh, what it is that we're doing with this podcast. The goal of this podcast is to go an episode at a time through the original classic hit that is Miami Vice. All the great colors and music and the original great cop show. We were set on a goal to go an episode at a time through this show and give one week one, once a week give a rundown on that on the episode that that we watched and really just have a great time going through all the fun and awkward conversations and scenarios that the great Sonny Crockett and Ricardo Tubbs get themselves into every week. And we are trying to, uh, because we've never seen the show before, give our honest reactions to what we think of the show being our first time watching it. And it's, uh, it, it's kind of interesting and kind of comical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, two thirds of this podcast is born after Miami Vice started. So we have quite a gap from the time when Miami Vice was originally on television to our modern era now that when we are running through going an episode at a time. I might have been born after it ended. (laughs) That's probably true, that it was already (laughs) over by then. (laughs) And yet I'm still putting myself through it. (laughs) And You still have a Don Johnson poster above your bed. (laughs) <laughs> I kiss it every night. <laughs> yeah, and what brought us to this point was that we are fans of the of the 1980s in general. Why? Because of all the unbelievably awesome yet terrible movies that came from that decade. We have watched so many bad movies that came from the 80s where we decided that we wanted to get together and do a podcast and wanted to talk about a show. Miami Vice just seemed like a natural fit. You look back on shows in the 80s, there's no, nothing more iconic than Miami Vice. And I think it kind of fits everything that we wanted in a TV show. Over the top, kind of corny, but also a lot of action, a lot of stuff to talk about, and a lot of stuff to make fun of. I think it really fit what we were looking for as far as something 80s that we could watch and that we could really just kind of break down and just have fun with. Well, enough about talking about us. Let's get on to this episode of Miami Vice. This is Season 1, Episode 10. I'm aware that it might be Episode 9. We are counting the pilot as two separate episodes. This is Season 1, Episode 9 of Miami Vice titled Glades. It originally premiered November 30th, 1984. And this, this is a bad episode, guys. This was this was bad. They barely had enough story to make it through an entire episode. Without much further ado, let's get into our rundown of this week's episode. So the episode starts with Crockett and Tubbs and Witness, who they are protecting, watching the cartoon Deputy Dog. They're in my a initial K-by thought, the hour hotel too, by the way. Why? Fancy. <laughs> I thought Witness <sighs> protection were was in like nicer places than that. The place didn't even have a door for the bathroom. Well, I'm pretty sure going to witness protection, unless you're Sonny Crockett, you go to, like to some slum shithole of a place. But if you're Sonny, you go to like this really nice house on the water, you know, out north of <laughs> Miami. Right. Like we've seen witness protection before in these episodes, and it was not in crap holes like they were in this time. So one of my well, favorite to things. Be fair to be fair, the episode yeah. starts playing the song we gotta get out of there uh, out of here by the animals which is the first part of the song is basically saying we're in the ghetto and we gotta get the hell out of here and when, when i first started this episode like i i loaded it all up and then i paused it right when i paused it it's like it's like two seconds into it it paused on a sign because in this in the very opening scene it's like a montage kind of going down through the streets in this part of i don't think it's miami right it's it's got to be somewhere else no it's south beach oh okay 
Well, it's it's, it, it's actually it, it's South Beach, but this is before they did the revitalization in the later eighties, mm-hmm. and so this is when South Beach was an asshole. Oh, the the whole thing looked like there was nothing else going on but sex. Like there was hookers, and there was nothing but new strip clubs and stuff like that. And on one of the strip clubs, where I had paused it just by chance. I paused it. There was a sign, and the sign said, Movie Arcade, 25 cents. And then, sound, color. Was there a point in time where you went to one of those sex arcades, like you, where you put in a, like you put in a quarter and you watch me, and it was in black and white? <laughs> wait, wait, were, you, were they charging extra for that? Where it's like, well, you can get the no sound, no color, but for what? an extra 25 cents, wait a minute, you can wait a add minute. some color. Extra fifty cents, we can add sound. Were there were there silent movie porn stars? <laughs> <laughs> There's like a piano. Then dun, wait, dun, 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 dun. And then it comes in black and white. Man, and <laughs> Charlie the Chaplin Nap- sitting on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> the Napster generation thought they had it bad trying to download their porn. <laughs> At least they got you know sound and video, like a full video with sound and um. And, and color. Well, yeah, like John was saying, in this section, they're like pr- pr- protecting a witness who's going to testify, as we find out later, about a guy named Ruiz who's running weed through the Everglades. And this guy's name is Bramlett. They're protecting him in this like shithole apartment somewhere in South Beach. Why do they care so and much about watching... a dude that's running weed? Like, Black tar, They're heroin, watching Deputy sure. Dog, which by the end of this episode, I would have rather been watching episodes of Deputy Dog. <laughs> <laughs> but before the the opening scene ends, we have the duo, Tubbs and Crockett. They swap places with Zwitek and Zito. And right before they leave, Zwitek hands Bramlett, the witness, they hands him an envelope and he reads it. And you can see it's like he's really messed up about it. Tubbs is the only one that notices that this, that when Bramlett reads this letter, there's something not right about him anymore. But they leave, and Zwitek and Zito, the B-team, are there to watch Bramlett on their shift. And then we go to the opening credits. I'm confused as to why so, someone who's in witness protection, why they don't, like, pre-check his mail or or do any of that. Like, why it was given to him in full confidence. Like, you open it. Like, we're not, we don't need to know what it says. It's good. You're fine. I, I just think risky. it's funny that back in the day, you had to threaten people with strongly worded letters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you know it's serious, because this word was underlined three times. <laughs> uh-huh. I hate that guy. Come on, let's go buy stamps. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a step up from, like, posting a note on the church door or something. You know, I, I appreciate business the old-fashioned way, though, where you made threats to people to their face. Unlike, well, I guess even back then, by a letter, it kind of feels empty now to tell someone to go, that you're going to kill them through Twitter. I think we can all appreciate a nice dot, like a dot mention. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good call out it's a, it's a quick way and 140 character limitation you get shit done <laughs> <laughs> maybe get right it to comes the point. at the end of a tweet storm I don't know but like ultimately I know what you're getting at <laughs> could you imagine someone sitting there just like I'm gonna kill you damn it I don't have enough okay I I uh, take out the apostrophe <laughs> <laughs> no more vowels <laughs> See, see, my just, problem just is, is I'm movies. adding too many people. I, I can't add all these people and still write this to threaten him. <laughs> can you follow me so I can send a DM? <laughs> <laughs> After the opening credits, we go to uh, the courthouse. Tubbs is testifying against this guy, Ruiz. Ru- Ruiz has been arrested. He's going to trial because he's. we know that he's a drug runner. But the reason why he got arrested is because he killed a cop. And that's what this guy, Bramlett, is ultimately what he's going to testify to. Is that he witnessed the killing of the cop. And he's going to testify against Ruiz. But you see Ruiz, he's like comically confident in court. Where it's like, oh, okay, Ruiz is going to kill this Bramlett guy. That's what's going on here. He's like super over the top, mm-hmm. cheesy, like stroking his beard that he doesn't have in court. You know, right. every time someone Checking says something, nails. he's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, I was distracted by the judge. 
they they got a guy that's like the Russian Judge Ito <laughs> up on the stand. I wasn't even paying just, attention to that. Yeah, like like seriously, he's 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 like Judge Ito, but then he's got like this Russian accent. It's like who the hell is this guy? Why did they cast him as the judge? The only good part about this episode is that we we know from this court scene that the next thing that's going to happen is Ramlet is going to get away. He's got he's got, and I'm drawing a blank on what it is, but in Cool Hand Luke, when Luke's mom dies he gets the letter the warden puts him in the box and he says something i can't remember what it is but he says like you know when something like this happens, he, he wants to run away. And you know, you're like from this court scene, because you see Tubbs testifying, you see Ruby's confidence that something's going to happen with Bramlett. And that's how we're going to get out to the Glades. It's pretty obvious. The name of the episode is Glades. That's where we're going to end up is out there. I thought the episode was going to take a different turn. I thought we were going to jump to a scene where Tubbs is banging the stenographer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was landed on thick with her yeah he comes off the stand he goes right over to her and just starts talking to her. she doesn't want nothing about it hey baby <laughs> <laughs> i oh, like so can... that his pickup is to, like to spell it out for her and she spells it back and it's like so a sonographer is known for typing quickly not necessarily like being a spelling bee champ you know <laughs> and yet here they are <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell she spelled out to him. Forget it. Okay. All right. That was, <laughs> it was too quick for me. I was like, F, T, well, A minute. Well, that was weird, too, right? Because she, she says, like, F-O-R-G-E-T-I-T. But then, I mean, that's – so do you – do you acknowledge the space? Do you not acknowledge the space? Because, like, it's two words. I gotta, I have to imagine that she's not just writing everything out in as one word as she's typing, right? The, the whole thing just seemed very contrived and, and strange. Also, she's so not his type. No, no, but I was very concerned. Very concerned that there was going to be a tub sex scene in this episode. But oh, say, I'm always concerned. Yes. Well, when we leave from the courthouse, you know, Tubbs testified. We learned that Ruiz is this Bramlett guy is the one that's gonna is gonna it's gonna implicate him. That's a concern. Ruiz seems super confident, but so do the vice cops. They seem real confident too that that Bramlett's gonna finally put him away. So we go back to Zito and Switek who are babysitting Bramlett at the uh, the slum lord apartment. They're like, what is Zito and Switek? doing like they're watching a, are they watching a tv show or a movie because they're arguing about something that happens in that and swipe so tech watching a soap opera that. and each the, other yeah they're piece. watching a yeah they're watching a, a soap opera and then Zwitech tech goes in to take a leak while zito makes a mustard sandwich and then <gasps> proceeds to go into the bathroom with Zwitech tech <laughs> yeah. while making his mustard sandwich he um does, to discuss put, he puts lunch meat on there is there lunch meat it looked like it was just mayonnaise i mean just mustard <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I like that. And then why does he take the towel off the door? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. He walks over and pulls out a piece of bread, puts on lunch meat, and then starts squeezing uh, mustard all over the lunch meat. Doesn't grab another slice of bread or anything. Just starts to fold it in half and follows Switek into the bathroom, which just seems really like strange, right? Like, first of all, I like I get creeped out by people who eat in the bathroom. I think that that's super gross. Like, I just have like a mental hang up about that. So that's like the me best that place walking, to eat. Like. You are guaranteed oh. not to get disrupted in there. Also, um, you could just continue to eat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, maybe that's like a parent's point of view, and I just don't know the struggle for that. But it's just being inefficient, Jenna. It's it's gross. Okay, it's that's super germy and weird. But also, Switek's in there, and he's taking a leak. But for all we know, there's no door or anything. So for all we know, he's popping a squat and actually like, you know, doing his business, and and he's just. Zito's just going in there, having, I don't know, days of our lives fandom session with him. I, like, I don't get that. <laughs> it was really weird. In that time, Bramlett takes that opportunity to just walk out the front door. It's not locked. There's no one watching him. He just walks right out. And there, Zito and Switek in their bathroom shenanigans aren't even in there that long. Like, it's literally seconds. Could they not... <laughs> Throw the door open and go chase his ass down. Right. They don't even try. So well, it's like in the next scene, mm -hmm. they jump to talking to the captain and Zwitek and Zito are getting reprimanded. And here come Tubbs and Crockett laughing because it's hilarious when you lose a witness in a major <laughs> murder trial. Hey, I mean, at least they lost him because Stubbs, or Tubbs and, and Crockett have, have most of their witnesses are killed. 
So maybe they just think it's funny that he's still alive. Yeah, he might still actually be alive out there. You know, it's like part of the joke. Like, oh, look, one got away. We need to shoot this one. Right, he's not dead on the uh-huh. snack shack down at the beach. Not to run this scene too quickly, but this leads us to the next very most, I want to say it's probably the most awkward short scene I've seen yet, where they walk into the Foxy Boxing Bar to yeah. talk to the guy. It's it's like it's like 30 seconds. They come in, they, they talk to the guy, and the guy's like, he's in the Everglades, and they leave. That's it. End of scene. Yeah, so when, they, when they're at the precinct, Castillo says, you got till Monday to bring him in. If you don't get him to court by Monday, Ruiz is going to get off. And it could go either way, right? Bramlett just runs off, they never find him. Or Ruiz is able to kill Bramlett before he's able to make his court appearance. Now, as far as I know, in courts, if if he's supposed to testify on Monday, but the witness disappears, I'm pretty sure they postpone and find yeah. out what happened to the witness. They don't just let you off. You can't just... Kill, like, not say not kill, but let's just let the witness go. And then, like, he just disappears. And then, like, I guess you could call it a mistrial. But then, but it's not like he gets found innocent, right? Yeah. Not yeah. in Russian Judge Ito's court. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where they go to that boxy boxing ring that John's talking about. Yeah, they head on down to Porky's. And Porky's is doing uh, foxy boxing now. It's like they he, they, he changed the model because he addresses it, that Foxy Boxing brings in more money. Than... And it makes less of a mess than mud wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so exactly, are they I'm referencing they the movie action. Porky's? Is that actually, like, are they actually referencing the movie Porky's? No. <laughs> because w- wasn't there mud wrestling in Porky's, in the strip club Porky's in that movie? I think there might have been. I don't know. Maybe I'm way out in left field here. It looked I'm... like Porky's, like the, the with the the sign with the woman, like, bending over, uh... It like it the the whole scene looked like Porky's. I I don't remember whether or not I, Porky's. I haven't done wrestling. any re- I haven't done any research on it, but I want to say Porky's was released around that time. Oh really? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm getting Porky's mixed up with Stripes because in Stripes there's the mud wrestling scene where John Candy wrestles with the two girls, and it's like famous because he didn't want to do it. They had to really coerce him to do it. That's a different <laughs> podcast. We'll talk about eight bad eighties comedies and or John Candy in general. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're right. This scene's really short. They talk to Harry. He's the one that runs the foxy boxing. He says he did see Bramlett. Saw him a few hours ago. And then he took off, and they asked him where they could find him, and he says he took off to the Everglades. But what's weird about this scene wasn't just how short it was, but also, like, Tubbs was the one doing all the talking, and Sonny was, like, longingly looking at Tubbs while he talked. They'd cut to Sonny, and he's just, like, like heart around Tubbs' face while he's watching him talk to, to Harry. Oh, they are absolutely, like, hard eyes whenever they look at each other. Yeah. There's a budding bromance there. It's one well, we can all also hope like- to accomplish. <clears throat> yeah, I mean that would be the <laughs> one Tubbs kiss that I would be okay with. <laughs> <laughs> so moist. <laughs> Speaking of that, this is maybe the first episode that they've had like excessive sweat that it made sense. I mean, it was still super gross, but at least like it made I can picture all of the sweat going on in the in the Everglades. The fact that it's like super humid and wet and everything swampland out there, but everything was very wet in this episode. Yeah, and before I forget, the music in this scene is I send a message by In Excess. In Excess. Yeah, which, you know, I don't think anyone's got any problems with with them. I just I I like when they walk into the to the bar, Tubbs does a Howard Cosell impression, and Crockett refer- uh, makes a reference calling him Don King. And so <laughs> I, I just think it's Racist. funny that Tubbs does this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Tubbs does a Howard Cosell impression that goes right over Crockett's head. He thinks, uh, "Oh, he must be doing a Don King impression." <laughs> okay, the impressions we'll get to once they get. Well, once we get to where they're out in the Everglades, where they're in Okeechobee, and they're supposed to have Texas accents, let's let's, let's talk about that later. Let's first get through this driving montage. Okay. So when, they, when they leave from the Foxy Boxing, they hit the road, and we get a we get a driving montage. One of two driving montages because they are clearly short on content for this episode, so they have to string out these montages with music. We have Girls with Guns by Tommy Shaw playing. Tubbs and Crockett are in his Ferrari with some fishing poles. You know, because they got to blend in while, while they're out there. As if Crockett and Tubbs 
will totally with their fishing poles will blend in in Okeechobee. They're, <laughs> yes, they are. Yes. I mean, I, I think I think it's pretty understood that the Everglades equals rednecks. I, I think that's been the same for a hundred years now. So they're just flying down the road, perfectly straight highway, heading out to the glades, out to Okeechobee. The music's blaring, and they're flying down the road, and they got their they got their poles with them, and they're heading out to Okeechobee. This is a long scene of them driving. They, I think they almost get through the entire song. Like, a long scene where they clearly mm-hmm. were like, oh, okay, you know what? We're not going to cut any of this footage because we did not have much of a script. So there's really nothing else going on. We don't, like, we need to stretch this. And this is a good point to stretch it because we can show some fog and, you know, yeah. stretch a highway. Well, if yeah. you didn't know, too, though, that Florida is the flattest state in the country. If, really? Like, because if, if they're under the biggest threat that if oceans rise, the entire freaking state's going to go underwater because it is the flattest state. So if you talk about the most boring state to have a driving montage in, it's Florida. There is literally no topographical change as they drive through Florida. It is totally flat. There's nothing out there. Yeah, I, I feel like they missed an opportunity for a song, too. I mean, they're using the Tommy Shaw song, but... There's a Merle Haggard song. God, what is it? It's Hokey from Okeechobee or something. Mm -hmm. But there there is a Merle Haggard song that actually references the name of the place that they are going. And I feel like it would have fit a lot better because it's a lot more country, you know, kind of sticks type of song. When they get to the end of the scene, they come pulling into this small, really small town out in the glades. And it's like a it's like a fishing tourism, but like ghetto fishing tourism spot. So like all the houses are really beat up. It's it's in really bad shape. There's a lot of people there, and there's clearly like tourists are coming in. They use this as like a launching point to go out into the swamps and go fishing. That doesn't sound like fun at all. Who? What? Who? Who? Does that as a vacation where they go out in the middle of the Everglades and go fishing in the swamp? There's none of that. It sounds like any fun. This whole thing what just kind looks of, horrible. What kind of fish are in the Everglades? And why would you fish in a swamp filled with alligators? I just don't. It doesn't make sense to me. No. And I'm sure there's people who may be from that area or been out there. It's like, oh, you can do this. You can do that. No. No, thanks. I'm out. Like, there's no reason. Big bugs, snakes, a giant ugly ass fish. You know, that's, those are places where they do that stuff like noodling and stuff like that, right? Where they got those giant ass catfish and stuff. No, I'm out. No, thanks. And they, Especially so they, if like you could go do deep sea fishing off the coast of like you go out Miami and then you don't have to deal with all the backwoods Everglades and the heat and all of the bugs and disgustingness of it all. You could just get on, get on your yacht and take a ride out or yeah. you know when they get there it's like a tourist town but all the tours are rednecks you know so it's not like they're city folk out there it's like people from other parts of the glades going there and but what did make me laugh is that when they get out of the car and they're looking around so they show that like they show this really fat guy sitting there just staring them down like but then they turn to the other side and there's a delorean parked on the road <laughs> <laughs> so that's where marty's been <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i think i think doc was like he got mixed up on time and then he ended up there and when he <laughs> got there he got kidnapped by those rednecks that live out there in the swamps and he's just stuck they he, they need someone to go out there and rescue him there's your fan fiction start hey. have fun <laughs> 10 out of 10 would read again. Okay. Come on. Like that's a much better story than what we watched. And Christopher Lloyd would never be seen again. <laughs> well, yeah. And that's what Crockett and Tubbs are talking about. As they're walking up Crockett. Tubbs is from New York. If he was ever, if there was ever a time he's out of his element, it's out here in the swamps. He can, he can handle Miami because it's just another big city, right? Yes. There's Florida people and he's, you know, he's getting used to that, but he's from New York and you take him into the swamp. So Crockett's telling him as they're walking up that there was one time, two DEA agents came out there to be undercover. They posed as fishermen and they never came back. So there's only two cops that have ever gone out there to do something and they totally disappeared. If you're Tubbs from New York, now living in Miami, you've been taken out to the swamps to find out the two cops that went out there and just disappeared. Don't you just turn around and get back in the Ferrari and leave at that point? And doesn't it make you want to be undercover as something other than two fishermen at that point? <laughs> Apparently it didn't work the first time. I mean, isn't Tubbs just uncomfortable in general, seeing as how this is like 
the mid 80s very conservative south and he's from new york where people are just very different and now they're going off into like the weird sticks people with no teeth who have very strong opinions about some things well when they they come walking up and they find a bunch of locals a bunch of super redneck locals which all of them look like they're actually from there except for the two characters that we'll know throughout this episode billy joe and floyd and right away Tubbs and crockett start talking to bill to floyd and they just cut straight to the chase like we're from texas we've been out here before we, we, last time we were here, we loved our guide and his name was Joey Bramlett. And so like, there was no like real police work done here. This like, Hey, anyone seen Joey? And uh, they uh, have like the worst Texas accents ever. Oh, I know. I know. It's just terrible. I mean, I thought Tubbs' Jamaican accent was bad, and then now the Texas accents, that's just, they're just trying to one up each other at that point. I would take both of them doing a Jamaican accent over both of them doing Texas at any point in time now. I wonder if they've ever been to Texas. Are they just trying to make this up? I think this is how they talk in, in Texas. Hi, boys. How, <laughs> top of the morning to you. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense why they'd be from Texas. See, why don't they just say they're from Miami? It makes less sense why they'd be from Texas. Yeah, I know. I mean, they'd have to drive much further from Texas. Once again, to the point, why would someone from Texas drive to the middle of nowhere in Miami? Yeah, it's got to I mean, be not Miami, someone local. Florida. Yeah, it's got to be someone local to Florida and nearby. Like, there's no reason why you go out here. You know, it's 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 in the middle of the state. Right. You know, it's not near a mm-hmm. coastline or anything, and it's not on the pan handle like it, it would make no sense for their sex so it makes less sense so whatever we're well aware that they are some of the worst undercover cops <laughs> so of course when they mention joey bramlett floyd's like yeah we know them you want us to take them take us out to your house and tubs the crock like yeah like okay th- that's random that within three minutes of getting there you totally trust the first two guys you run into to take you out to go to go find joey right and this is where we get our second driving montage so now Tubbs and Crockett are in the back of like a brand new Jeep. Floyd's driving, Billy Joe in the passenger seat, and they're just hauling ass through the swamp. And it's like these slow-mo shots every time they hit like a puddle of water because they're really trying to drag out this driving montage. And the banjo scene's kind of playing in my head. I've got images of deliverance thinking floyd's gonna try and make him squeal like a pig oh yeah and it gets it gets even closer to deliverance because when they pull out to the end of this road they think no tubs crock i think they're going to joey's house but when they get there floyd and billy joe just take him out in the middle of nowhere hold him at gunpoint make him get out of the car so billy joe pulls a gun on him and then we have like a jump scene from there in the jeep to tubs and crockett on their knees with B- B- billy joe holding the gun out to him like oh my god no I'm, i i can't handle this there's no way i i can even get through deliverance don't do this to sunny miami vice changed that day in the swamp <laughs> <laughs> man and they butchered that clint eastwood quote you know go ahead yeah. uh, ru- ruin my day or something that's what I think is like all of them must all the actors must have been from here except for Floyd. Floyd is like he's he was in a bunch of TV shows. He was in Mad About You. You know, he's uh, we've seen him. But he's a big time actor. But I'm pretty sure everyone else is just native to this part of Florida. They just picked up random people they found on the street. And it makes sense because, I mean, they filmed a lot of this in a place called Crocodile Alley or Alligator Alley. Either way, it's not good. What do they keep getting themselves mixed up in? Can you imagine Sonny and, uh, you know, Don Johnson on set out there? Like, what the fuck are we doing out here? I bet, uh, kiss what Rodriguez is like, yeah. (laughs) 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 Got out just in time. Floyd and Billy Joe just leave Sonny and Crockett, or Sonny, Sonny and Crockett, Sonny and Rico just out in the middle of nowhere. They take off. They just leave them there. Rico and Sonny start, they just start walking it. And we have this really awkward scene where like Sonny's trying to be a boy scout and he's talking about like moss always yes. grows on the north side of the tree, but the sun's in the wrong place. So I thought, was it supposed to be funny? Was it supposed to be that Crockett was just confused? Like what, what was it we supposed to take away from this? The only thing I took away from the scene is that Tubbs is just up a creek. He's from New York. 
He's out in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, I was really right shoes. But yeah, that's just just awkward. So now they're stomping around through the swamp, uh, trying to figure out which way is east, why the sun's in the south, and they end up getting held up at gunpoint by two women who you'd think they'd be more happier to see considering they have no chance of ever getting out of this swamp oh yeah and it's like the group of people that get taken by it's like you're right there's two women there's this guy and one of the women is like grandma grandma's got like an elephant gun she's like barely able to hold it up it's like it's it's again like get from here these these are locals i mean it Uh, has a sense uh, of authenticity to it that's for sure so now i have a feeling they they know what squirrel tastes like and have probably cooked it recently Now, the duo have been taken hostage, again, by a totally new group of people. They they hop in the boat. They're taking a boat through the swamp. And I'm thinking the whole time, like, why do people live here? Why do people live here? Why do people live here? They're going on this little fishing boat through the swamp. Cassie is the woman's name. She's the only one in the boat. She's got Tubbs and Crockett, and they're cruising out to her house. The only thing we learn in that scene is that her name is Cassie. They pull up to the house, and when they walk inside, there's, like, five people in there and not with like rifles which is what you would expect these hicks that live out there would have we're talking like they look like ak-47 freaking machine guns is what these people have right and they're holed up in this house and one of them is joey bramblett so they happen to stumble on by chance find him and i forgot to mention that when they first get Tubbs and crockett cassie knows who they are it's like you guys must be Tubbs and crockett they were kind of expecting them to come out so once they get to the house they see all the people we have a jump scene where we jump forward and it's bramlett well, well in that first in that scene when they first get to the house i just jimmy starts introducing everyone and it's like this is billy bob this is bob and joe this is jimbo <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's Deshaun. he's not from here <laughs> Okay, so I jumped ahead too far, too, because I wanted to talk about one of them. I don't know what his name is. I think it's he's like Billy Bob or something like that. He's got a neck beard. He's got a trucker hat on, his hair sticking out, and he suspiciously looks like my brother-in-law. I'm pretty <laughs> sure Dan makes an appearance in this episode of Miami Vice as one of the hicks in this house. Hey, now. That's hey Deshaun. Now. He's not from here. <laughs> He's keeping the neck beard under control, okay? <laughs> you don't know anything. So in the house, a little bit of time passes. We come to Crockett and Tubbs are just hanging out in the group of, there's like a gang. They have had they have them surrounded and Cassie and Joey, Bramlett, their hu- husband and wife, and they're explaining that Ruiz has taken, tried to capture Cassie and their daughter, Tammy. Cassie, the wife, was able to escape, but Ruiz's men were able to take Tammy, and they now have her hostage at a house near town. And that's why Bramlett took off when he got the letter. It was a letter from Ruiz saying that they that they have his daughter, and they're going to kill her if he testifies. He runs out. He gets the boys back together, and they're going to go get Tammy. But they can't because the house is full of some local members Columbians. and 20 Colombians. Yes. I feel like the Colombians are unfairly represented here. It just seems weird to me that a group of 20 Colombians are hanging out in this little tiny redneck town. I mean, if you're if you're living in Colombia and someone comes to you, like, hey, I got this job for you. Like, great. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to work or whatever. You know, two years later, you wake up and you're in Okeechobee, Florida. You're like, what am I? doing with my life how did i get yeah 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 hey please leave the jungle and come to the everglades (laughs) yeah what happens is is that cassie and joey convince they're they're telling them that the reason they actually kind of wanted tubs and crockett to come out looking for them and the reason why is because they need help dealing with this hostage scenario to get their daughter back and they pitch the idea that they want them to come help them even though they're vastly outnumbered and the only conclusion we come to at the end of this scene is that Tubbs says well we'll we'll go take a look at the house with you and see what's going on we go to that night Tubbs and crockett and joey all sneak around outside of the house where tammy's being held and there is the house is full of people there's a whole bunch of people standing on the deck they see floyd and billy joe get into their truck and then they drive away this this is definitely the house where tammy's being held and it's full of people they are vastly outnumbered in there at this point in the show i am confused why they have not contacted fellow law enforcement to help them raid the house and why instead are they gonna help this 
vigilant, uh, do this vigilante justice with this ragtag militia. And is any of this legal? Well, I'm confused as to why you think there's local authorities. Well, there's still like you can call the state police, right? You know, or this county sheriff this, yeah. or something. But this totally doesn't he, seem like the kind of place that any that any kind of authority would ever spend time actually like coming in to try and help. And if they would, they'd be like super crooked. They're probably being paid off by the Colombian. I'm pretty sure. Weird lords. I'm pretty. Sh- I'm pretty sure though. I'm pretty sure that he's a witness in a federal case. Um, oh yeah. Well, I mean, like I feel like uh, the feds should probably have taken this on. Oh yeah. There's than... never a point in time where Tubbs and Crockett can come back and tell Castillo, like, look, when we went to go pick up Joey, <laughs> we worked with this local militia to murder twenty Colombians <laughs> and a handful of locals to get this to get their daughter back that way we can bring him in to testify there's no way they're ever going to be able to talk their way out of that no yeah well when they come back from so. doing the, their investigation Tubbs pitches the idea that they go sorry that that, that that's a little bit later clem says that yeah yeah no when, out, they, when they first when they first get back uh someone someone who is very skilled by the way builds an exact replica of a model house no that's that, <laughs> that, that, that that's that next scene that i'm talking about where they do like their planning. Okay. This is before, so I, I think... I want to know which one of them built that. So, so, okay, in this... Let's let's stop for just a second. In this, because we're, talk, we're talking about my favorite character in this episode. In the gang, there's a bunch of young dudes, and then Grandma and Pop, or Clem is, is his name. Old dude with, like, three teeth in his head. He has got to be a local man out there. He cannot be a regular... He's just got to be a local guy. Tubbs oh, yeah, his- I... I- I've nicknamed him Two Tooth Charlie. Clem says that he knows that there's a, a new shipment coming in from Colombia. And Tubbs pitches the idea that what they can do is they can go shoot up that, that new shipment coming in, distract everyone over there. That makes it easier for them to break into the house where Tammy's being held and get Tammy out. Clem then, because he's fucking awesome and i love this old man he says that he can find out the next morning where the shipment is coming in they don't know when or where the shipment is gonna land it's a pretty small town so i think that it's and it's coming in by seaplane so i don't think to take much guessing how or where it's coming in or when they could probably figure it out by just listening for a giant fucking seaplane coming in to this little <laughs> tiny town yeah the old man is gonna go work his way in and he's gonna find out when the drugs are gonna come in which is weed, if we're not talking like heroin or cocaine like in all the other episodes, when the weed is going to come in, then they'll be able to plan this attack. Plan starts to go into action now. The next morning, Clem goes into town. When he gets into the town, this amazing old man opens up the hood for Ford's truck and he dis- he disables some of it. Or it's Billy Joe's truck. He, he messes with the engine, makes it so it doesn't work. So now he's got to get a ride with Clem. Apparently, Clem is just this old man that just helps you do anything. So he's like, he went shopping with Billy Joel, with Billy Joel, with Billy Joe. <laughs> he went shopping with him. He's helping him carry his bags out to Clem's truck. And he's going to drive Billy Joe back out to the house. Apparently, the gang is unaware that Clem is working with this, with Bramlett's team. He finds out when that meeting is going to happen. He's able to, like, pretend like he's just an old, senile man. He convinces Billy Joe to tell him when the drugs are going to come in. Does he put bread in his jar? <laughs> And he finds out. So he finds Sorry, out. I couldn't help. I couldn't. I had to make a piano man reference there. Uh, okay, that We've one. We officially lost that one down. What audience we had? <laughs> <laughs> to all the Billy Joel fans out there, we are, we are now to all obscure. three of us. <laughs> I've officially narrowed it down to just me and one other person. <laughs> you've you've gone full. What is it, uh, Daniel Tosh? Like you just keep narrowing it down and narrowing yes. it down so you got the one person. Okay, so after Clem finds out all this information and there was like a brief discussion with bramlett family discussing like how they got started and stuff like there were alcohol runners during prohibition and then they tried to just be they tried to go legit and that couldn't make them enough money so they started smuggling weed we get to that night they're gonna start they start their planning and this is the scene john where they have this great dollhouse and it happens to be dolls that kind of look like crockett and tubs ready to go to show their plan <laughs> Crockett and Tubbs bring their own dolls. <laughs> They're prepared for, for the, just such an occasion. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's just a testament in. to how good of a whittler Clem is, because he just whittled <laughs> them up right then and there. It is just, it is just amazing how quickly they 
built that model house. I mean, I guess it's supposed to make a little sense because, like, they have a young daughter, so there's a doll house there. But I'm suspicious because there's there's a doll on top of the house. So the plan is that they're going to shoot up. Tubbs is going to have a team. They're going to go down. The, and the team that Tubbs has is, has Joey on it. They're going to go down to the docks, the main dock in town where the seaplane is going to land and the drugs are coming in. They're going to shoot up the drug shipment to distract when Sonny's team is going to attack the house. They're going to kill, they're basically going to kill everyone at the house and get Tammy out of there. In the planning with the so, dollhouse, they have a person wearing a white suit up on the roof. I don't know how they were prepared, that prepared for Sonny coming and that that was going to be his plan, that they have a doll with a white suit on the roof of the dollhouse. Thank God for the RB 80s Labor Day collection. <laughs> Yeah, and, and at this point, let's just recap. So we have two off-duty cops, a small local militia, and who are going to attack a group of Colombians with a witness they're supposed to be protecting, attacking a group with automatic weapons. And at this point, still no police involvement. They haven't even made a phone call to let their chief know where they are, what they're doing, and the, or that the fact that they're planning on killing about 20 to 30 people. Yeah, it's just, they're totally, it's like run and gun, no law. I guess it's supposed to be like there's no law out there, so you can do whatever you want. Maybe this is going to be okay, but it's kind of a tourist town too, so. Yeah, I don't think yep. that that's how so, any of this works. So back to the episode, they attack at sunrise. Yeah, so they get, <laughs> they get set up that night at 2 a.m. For some reason, Clem says, oh, sorry. Billy Joe needs Clem's truck at 2 a.m., but the plane isn't going to land until dawn. Both teams get set up at 2 a.m. Tubbs' team down at the dock, Crockett's team out at the house. Crockett sneaks up on the roof. And at this point, I'm thinking, so this is the house where Tammy's being held. He's the one that's going to drop into the house through the skylight and go save Tammy. Meanwhile, Tammy's dad isn't on this team. Tammy's dad is on the team that's going to go shoot up the duck. Sure, let's not have any of her parents uh, try and get her out of that house. Then on top mm -hmm. of that, Sonny's able to sneak onto the roof undetected. If he could do that, why doesn't he just get her out and sneak back out? He can clearly get past these terrible <laughs> guards that are surrounding the house. I'm just amazed he found a white suit that fit exactly what the doll was wearing. <laughs> So here we go. This is the final. Well, yeah, this is the final scene. We have our action scene. This is when things going to happen. The seaplane comes in and it lands. This is a big ass seaplane. They start unloading at the docks. Tubbs' team starts shooting at the people who are unloading it. On that team, Floyd is there. Floyd and Billy Joe is at the house where Tammy is. So they both start at the same time. Tubbs' team starts shooting at, starts having a shootout with the people at the dock, and Sonny's team shoots and kills. Everyone standing on the porch at this house. All of them are dead. They've So right out of the gate, we have like 10 people killed. They quickly kill almost everyone on both teams. The This gang, this militia gang that attacks the Colombians is like is a bloodbath. They drop everyone so fast. And they're all kill shots. They're not like maim or wound or anything. They're all, I mean, they're just massacring both sides. On Sonny's team, it Sonny finally drops down in. But on Tubbs' team... Floyd, his gun like jams up and so he stands up and puts his hands up like he's going to surrender. And then he just takes off running. And I don't really blame him at this point. I don't think anyone was prepared on their side to get just massacred. I mean, to the point where I don't know why they had to wait for Tubbs and Crockett. They seem to do fine at killing these Colombians themselves. Yeah, but it's man, clear all if I'm Floyd, needed, yeah, it's clear all they needed was just someone with a brain. Like, they didn't need help yeah. from shooting or nothing. They just needed someone to give them a plan. Like, they could have just wrote to Sonny, like, can you please send us a detailed <laughs> plan? <laughs> yeah, we I have, mean, are, are these the McCoys in the hat or the Hatfields? Um, are these the Hatfields and McCoys that are living out here? Yeah, I mean, I, God, man, if I'm Floyd, I'm running too. <laughs> Dear Jesus, they're murdering people. <laughs> <laughs> and you see Floyd. He starts running, and you see him in the background, and Tubbs, instead of shooting him, which for some reason, he decides not to shoot and kill Floyd. I don't know what they're going to do with him, because they never go back to the, the people that they captured, but they've literally killed everyone else. Why stop now? But Tubbs decides <laughs> he's just going to drop his gun and chase after Floyd. And and based on Crockett's team, I think there's a breakdown of communication, because Crockett's team seems to want to leave no witnesses to this. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas Tubbs seems to want to capture Floyd, and it's like, 
Like you, you, he can't be. You can't leave a witness, man. We've got to feed these guys to the alligators, so no one knows we just murdered thirty people. It's bad. I mean, they kill a lot of people. So Sonny drops down into the house. There are six people dead on the porch. Okay, Sonny drops in. He shoots two more people. So now we're up to eight. No, no, no. Let, let's get this correct. Shoots one person. The other guy faints before he's able to fire his weapon. <laughs> let's just make that clear. The guy on the left clearly falls before t- uh, Crockett even pulls his gun up. <laughs> like, he just drops to the ground. Ah! <laughs> Once again, locals, not actors, is who was hired for the extras in this in this episode. It's got to be, because you're right. Like, both of them just drop. Like, Sonny doesn't even fire, and they're already dropping. Yes, so- the guy dropping from the ceiling was such a frightening thing. They both just <laughs> fainted. <laughs> so Sonny shoots and kills both of them shoots quotes both of them so now we're up to eight he shoots another one uh no sorry then he comes around the corner and he sees billy joe he's got tammy as a hostage got her by the back of the neck he's holding the gun to her head and he's like you're gonna let me out of here or she's gonna die and i forget what sonny says he delivers some line and then he just shoots billy joe square in the face yeah that's not traumatizing to little tammy or anything that's cool she'll be fine Mm -hmm. apparently how this episode is gone this might just be a common occurrence out in the out in Okeechobee. Oh, maybe. That's what I'm saying. That's why I was comparing it to these people to the Hatfield and McCords, because it seems like they're in their own little world out here. Like, whatever happens, happens, and then they just ditch the bodies in the swamp and no one and everyone goes on like nothing happened. It was a firefight. So now we're up to so we're up to nine people killed. Sonny finally convinces Tammy to come to him. He picks her up and starts carrying her out the front door. As he's carrying out the front door. They, so the gang is pulling one guy who's still alive. They do take one person alive. They do take uh-huh. one more person out alive. And then he comes out and Cassie comes running up and he hands Tammy to Cassie. They've been reunited. And meanwhile, Clem, who the old man, he's been on their team, but his gun is jammed every single time. He's got this like, they call it like a, a gator gun. So it's like a giant. musket. And so it's been jamming every time. But now, here we are at the last scene. Croc is handing over the child. Joey Bram was standing next to Sonny. This person comes out of the house. He's got his gun pointed right at Joey. This is going to be where they're able to save Tammy. But Joey's going to get killed before he can testify against Ruiz. Clem, right, with a money shot, with a freaking elephant gun, buckshot elephant gun, shoots and kills this person, who this last person that, that was inside of the house, and saves Joey's life. He can still testify against Ruiz. Now there are ten and we get people a nice dead at this close house. Up, and we get a nice close up at this point of Two Tooth Charlie smiling with his uh, <laughs> with his meth mouth. Um, <laughs> like, I done good. <laughs> and that's not including, if we got ten people dead at this house, that's not including how many people are dead out at the dock. They, they jump now to trying to get Jimmy to court. Uh, on time, and at the at the end of the episode, it ends with them getting him there just in the nick of time. Yeah, right. And so we don't see to drop his gavel right before Russian Judge Ito drops the gavel and dismisses the case. There is no mention on what happens to all the bodies out there. What they're gonna do with this uh, big ass plane that is just floating in their swamp now? Yes, yeah, sure. Or what happened that. to all of that marijuana that was on that plane that is now in the hands of people who were admitted alcohol grunners, moonshiners back in the day? Yeah, I don't know what, like, yeah, what are all these bodies going to do? There's this giant plane out there. I mean, eventually the Colombians are going to want their plane back, right? So, like, did they just yeah. start, like, like a drug war out <laughs> of Chobe? I'm pretty sure they did. It's you know, there's no mention of any law enforcement. I mean, they don't reference any law enforcement. So, yeah, they just leave Okeechobee with witness. And they just leave all of the hicks out there, the Hatfields and the McCoys, with 300 pounds a pot and brand new seaplane. Um, yeah. And all of these semi-automatic weapons. Not like, including you guys will clean up, to, right? Yeah, yeah. Not including whatever happened to the two people they captured. Is there, right. like, serious waterboarding torture happening out in Okeechobee, too? Well, at least in this episode, we make it through where the main protagonist didn't die. 
where we they bust in with Joey. He's going to testify. You know, there's a stare down when he walks up onto the stand. They're able to save it just at the last minute before the judge is going to dismiss the case. He's going to testify and put Ruiz away. Both parents, Cassie and Joey, are still alive. So little Tammy doesn't have to grow up an orphan. So (laughs) all in all, in reality, the Miami Vice team did a pretty good job. We've set the bar so low. (laughs) That pretty much sums it up for this rundown on this episode. Let's, uh, Let's move on to the music. All right, John, take it away. We actually have a lot of music in this episode. Well, so the music is pretty generic. I mean, we have We Gotta Get Out of This Place by The Animals, which is used in the open. It was released in 1965, and the band disbanded in 1969 and then reunited in 1983. So kind of pretty much this song is being used because uh, the band had just reunited and started touring again. Main things about this song is that Rolling Stone named it number 233 on their list of 500 greatest songs of all time. I'd agree, but I like the animals. What is kind of interesting to know, as a side note, is that originally the song was written for the Righteous Brothers, for whom they they actually, the lead singer of the animals, actually wrote You've Lost That Loving Feeling for the Righteous Brothers before this. And then they wrote this song, We Gotta Get Out of This Place for the Righteous Brothers, but they ended up getting a record deal instead. And so they... They recorded it instead, and that's kind of what launched their career in the 60s. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, sucks for the Righteous Brothers. So the next song is I Sent a Message by NXX, uh, NXX, NXX. By a band that you probably know, yes. <laughs> uh, and they used this during the Foxy boxing scene, and... The song was released on the album Swing in April 1984. The only thing I could find that was pretty, that was actually interesting about this is that Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates actually provided the backup vocals in this song. So there's that. Uh, last, uh, lastly, we have Girls with Guns by Tommy Shaw. So if you don't know who Tommy Shaw is, Tommy Shaw was the lead singer of Styx. And in the, it, about this time in the 80s, Tommy Shaw and the rest and the rest of the band Sticks were arguing over which direction they were going to go. Tommy Shaw wanted to go more of a rock avenue, whereas the rest of the band was trying to go more of a pop avenue. And so Girls With Guns is the only top 40 hit that Tommy Shaw really had when he released his three solo albums after leaving the band in the 80s, uh, at this point in the 80s. He would later, in 1989, join up with Ted Nugent to form a band called Damn Yankees, which, obviously, pretty much, um, this song was the beginning of the end of Six and the beginning of Damn Yankees. So um, we can blame this song for ruining sticks. And (laughs) I mean, was it ruining sticks? Is this what ruins sticks? Uh, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure the the going down the pop a- a- angle is what ruins sticks, but I'm gonna blame Tommy Shaw anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the music. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of interesting facts along with it, except that two of these songs came out in '84, and one of them happened to be when. Uh, just a very popular song that kind of fit the scene. So, all right, well, let's let's move on to our final thoughts. All right, guys, it was a it was a struggle to get through this episode. Let's uh, let's hurry up and sum this thing up. That way, we can move on to hopefully a much better episode of Miami Vice next week. Jenna, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Uh, I mean, I really, I'm, I have no idea. Like. This episode was so bad, and I had really high hopes, right? I feel like there was such an avenue to go, like, with the kitschy, uh, glades deliverance sort of feel of things, get one of those, like, helicopter boat-looking things and, like, float around, and, like, they could have done it very over-the-top Miami Vice-esque, right? Um, and I we didn't get that. We got, like, what I would imagine is much more true to life, but just, like, weirdos in the cutties that are like doing things that nobody even really cares about. So the fact that they can 
mass murder people and then just two step it away with no repercussions and and everyone just accepts that uh, as like okay and you know dust off the hands i'm glad that we got him back to the courthouse in a couple of hours since we just you know kill shot like 30 people and, and everyone watching was just like makes sense uh is is a little ick to me but i don't know i'm hopeful for i'm glad that we at least had a good episode last week with the uh with the epic boat race and yeah there's I'm at sure, least more, sure we'll more exciting stuff on the water than there is driving to florida yeah exactly like I, i'm sure that we'll get back into it like we'll get a good elvis episode maybe we can start breaking more into uh oh this would have been so much better if they brought elvis with <laughs> like yeah i like, know uh, Crockett and Gina romance, like I, I, st- I'm, I'm holding hope that someone's gonna give more of that to me, like than side story, but we'll see. Well, you know, my final thoughts on this episode is like, you know, it's just, it kind of feels like it's one of those episodes where it's like for network TV, it's like we have to fill 22 or 24 episodes, whatever it is. Like this one's close enough, get it out there. When you see how it's filmed, it kind of looks like they filmed it way before it aired. This might be one of those scenarios where it was like, it may have been a pilot or maybe before a pilot. It just feels like they filmed it way before it actually aired. So that might be what the struggle is with this episode, why tonally it feels weird because of how the episodes have gone. This might just be out of order because they plugged it in somewhere where it might, where it shouldn't have been. Sometimes this show gets frustrating because like Tubbs and Crockett kind of are mass murderers at this point, but they, you know, <laughs> like they're luckily. a bigger threat to Florida than they are healthy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but as I mentioned, like they, this is probably as good as it can get, right? Both parents survived. The bad guys go into jail. They did their job. You know, they, they thumbs up guys. Good job. We got through this episode. Good job, team. Let's move on to the next one. John, what what are your final thoughts? So, like I said in the beginning, I would have rather watched an episode of Deputy Dog. I feel like that's a vastly underrated cartoon. And uh, it's actually not very available. Um, I'm I'm looking around. I can't find it anywhere. Um, If you find old episodes of Deputy Dog, please forward them to me. I would really enjoy (laughs) watching that. So those are my final thoughts on this episode is um, I really like Deputy Dog and uh, the other cartoons that they did. And uh, I miss those type of cartoons. All right. Well. That's going to do it for this week. The feel for us this week. Thanks for listening to the show. You can always contact us. We would love your feedback. You can email the show, go with the heat at gmail.com. Check out our website at go with the at go with the heat.com. And you can, we'd love to hear from you. You can get us on Twitter. Just search for go with the heat. You can find me. I'm at Dom Corvo. You can find Jenna on Twitter at Jenna A. Barham. You can find John. At Corvo underscore John. We'd love to hear from you. Email the show. Check, check out our website. Be sure to subscribe. That's going to do it for us this week. Make sure to come back next week when we move on to hopefully a much more coherent story of Miami Vice. Bye, pals. And if you have any episodes of Deputy Dog, please forward them along with your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs>